Listen. Have you gotten to play with yourself yet? Like, have you gotten to play with your figure? I have your Funko Pop, oh, but I, I haven't. Play, <laughs> I play with myself every day. Oh, yeah. Okay. I Same. play with myself. Oh. I, uh... So the MCU is now on movie 25, and contrary to the naysayers, it definitely looks like they got plenty of life to go. And what I really liked about this one is that it comes off like a family drama that hits at the emotions since it comes from director Dustin Daniel Cretton, who did one of my personal favorite movies, Short Term 12, which I highly recommend. But here we also finally get to see some good hand-to-hand -hand action to Marvel Land, and I personally think it, it amounts to a combo price, especially if you catch it in IMAX since you'll literally see more of the frame, but I also know that Disney Plus should be getting it soon for those who can't go out, and for that, thanks to our sponsor Nebula, who's looking to get the movies to come to you. So even though I'm pretty sure like everyone's already seen this one, a big spoiler warning from the jump. Let me explain. You got this, bro! My bad. So this time around, Marvel decided to give us something new, you know, something that we've never seen before, and they hit us with an origin story. We follow Sean, who lives in San Francisco, working as a valet driver with his best friend Kate, who drives to that city like me and Watch Dogs too. He always spends his time at Kate's convenience, since they've known each other since they were high school kids, which is why her grandma's always hinting at them getting married, but, you know, they just say that they're just friends who do everything together, including saving the world, so we'll see. I was surprised by how big her character ended up being, cause she really does play his other half on this journey, along with being the comedic relief, which I do think Aquafina can be funny, as long as the project is PG-13 or above, but the one thing that she definitely doesn't miss with is having an agent who's declared that there will be no Asian cinematic milestone without her involvement. I know that you don't like to talk about your life, but a guy with a freaking machete for an arm just chopped our butts in half. Like everyone stated, it's the action in this bad boy that really delivers from the the bus scene down to the training montages, they got the world champion of Tai Chi to train them, they even got the late great Brad Allen who recently did the Kingsman trilogy and goes way back to the camp of Jackie Chan where he was the first non-Asian guy to join his stunt team, even getting the nickname Bai Hu, so it's safe to say that they went all in. We spent like a month on the bus and then it was like we were playing catch up for the other and then for this one for whatever reason we just didn't have as much time shooting it so I remember for the whole scaffolding scene it was like learning choreography two minutes before I was set to go up and do it. Now to me, the best one hands down is the bus sequence, cause they actually shipped these buses from San Francisco to Sydney, put them on hydraulics in order to film in them, and even the bus and the route that it goes on is meant to reflect back to the Chinese activists who were fighting for transportation in San Francisco to get to and from Chinatown, and now it's up be mortalized on screen by having Sean completely wreck it. The bad guys come in in order to take the pennant that his mom gave him as a kid, as he faces off with young Drago who's playing Razor Fist, a bunch of minions who just get bopped, and this masked dude who was way overhyped in the trailer. But I love the action because it's one of those that has some really great setups with payoffs. This man will be fighting and using his sweater as a weapon, he made a dance out of his punches, uses a goon as a plank, and it's after that first fight that he actually goes viral because of this buzz blogger who must be killing it with his lives because this dude moved from New York to San Francisco. The bad guys do end up snatching his pendant, causing them to go from driving fast and furiously straight to the backstory of his family as they head to China to find a sister before they take her necklace as well. You change your name from Shang to Sean? I wonder how your father found okay, you. I was 15 years old. It's at this underground fight club on the 40th floor where we get to see Wong again as he's literally fighting to keep the lights on because Lord knows Steven doesn't care. But it was dope to see him appear here again because not only was he the first in the MCU, but in true Wong fashion, dude continues to come in and dips once he does what he's got to do. You know, for a while it was quite uh, lonely being the only Asian in the MCU. Uh, and now we have the Asian Assemble. Shang-Chi ends up finding his sister, Shaoling, who he faces off with for a bet, only to realize that she's the one who's been running this club, which is just as badass as the fact that this is also the actress, Menger's first role. In fact, she even called up the production to change a part of her character so that it wouldn't come off as a stereotype and went all in on her stunts to the point that she straight up punched Simu in the face. I did punch him in the face. That's why I love it. <laughs> I hated fighting her. She has the boniest arms <laughs> ever. I didn't mean to, but it felt good. Granted, story-wise, you know, he did leave her as a kid, so it does make sense. And it just made me think about how many bums in this universe are probably using the snap as an excuse for not showing up. Like, you know, I, I was gonna come see you, but the, the blip. That it that it's been three blips. 15 years later, and their dad does find them, played by the legend Tony Leong in his first big American production. You having fun? <laughs> no? Yes. Yes. This man needed no de-aging as they flash back to how he found these rings that gave him immense powers like strength and eternal life. He has a whole army that's helped him topple governments with spies inside S.H.I.E.L.D. and HYDRA. It's the 10 rings that catapulted Tony into becoming Iron Man in the first movie. And to a degree, they hype him up as being the one who's been altering the MCU timeline this entire time. Which, 
I think makes him like the third character this year to be doing that. But damn, has it been a minute since I've seen some really cool powers up on screen? Like, not only have they only shown a fraction of what these rings can do, but they actually look dope. Like, I was ready to go in and raid my abuelita's jewelry just so I can take them to a con. And you'll never see me coming. He even calls out Dis Trevor for Grand Theft appropriating his image and taking the name of the Mandarin like he did in that Iron Man 3 twist that I know ticked off a lot of fans, but like, I guess now it's fixed, so... Next one on the test list is Taskmaster. In 1996, after reigning supreme for thousands of years, he realizes there's nothing left on Earth to conquer, except his heart. So after coming across Lee in the forest, he falls for this timeless romance and leaves behind his infernal affairs in order for them to be happy together. And it turns out that the whole set was in a mood for love, since even Menger, who plays Xiaoling, met her husband, who was one of the action designers while filming, and even Fala, who plays the mom, well, this is so surreal. I'm in the middle of nowhere and they just called me and made the offer. Um, so that was really, like, really, really exciting. But I guess the drawback was I had to leave my honeymoon two days early and um, left my husband there with all my luggages. And I just went straight to Australia for the training. Um, but I think it's worth it. I'm sure he will agree. Um, problem is, is that due to his past, her village of Tao Lo wants absolutely nothing to do with him, so he decides to put away his ten rings, for one, as he starts his own little family with Lee out in the forest, but like, I, I don't really know what he did with his goons, like, did he just give him a severance package? Cause he really just left him to go play DDR with his kids. It isn't until his wife's death that he goes back to his old ways, trains his son to become a killer, and actually sends Shang-Chi out to go avenge her death, causing him to go his own way. But it's because of their penance that their dad, Wen Wu, goes after them again, when he realizes that they're actually the dragon eyes he needs in order to unlock the map that would lead him back to her mystical village of Tao Lo, which you just know they're already imagining a bamboo maze right over at Disneyland. Thing is, Wen Wu swears that his wife is calling out to him from beyond, not realizing that he's actually getting duped by a soul eater who's prying on his grief in order to be set free. So while Wen Wu is a bad guy, I guess it's in the name of love. Like it sucks for a man who's reigned for millennium, so just have it all fall apart, but I thought it made sense in terms of how his love ends up being his biggest soft spot and how that loss consumes him eventually even becoming his biggest weakness so he decides that heaven can wait in order for him to see his wife again as he hops in that midnight express straight to her not realizing his son's become a full out hero ready to stop him and that's where we meet michelle yo's character of ying nan who's her aunt she warns them of a monster known as the dweller in darkness that attacked her universe and is now prepping to attack the mcu after four thousand years and honestly when this thing showed up i thought it was the ugliest thing that the MCU has shown since Malekith the Accursed. And, and that dude was so dreadful it almost made Chris Hemsworth quit. Michelle reminds them that tomorrow never dies as they unleash their mythical lions, tigers, and bears to take out this hidden dragon as Disney continues to marvel at their daddy issues and has Shang-Chi face off with his dad, which considering their history, I thought made for a really good final fight that was way more impacting, at least for the parts that I could see. But when this man snatched up all 10 bands from his dad, Ugh! Kate learns that if you aim at nothing, you hit nothing, and ends up with some better kills than Hawkeye after legitimately having one day of picking up a bow. Wen Wu sacrifices himself when he realizes his mistake, everybody teams up, and we see Shang-Chi go through his own rebirth underwater, awakening the great protector that helps guard the village and taking out more than Daenerys did with her dragons. In the end, I really did like the themes of the movie, especially when it came to its characters having to face the different sides of their lives. Like in the beginning, we saw Kate's grandma bring up how different Americans are when it comes to letting go when someone dies, which is then contrasted with Wen Wu, who lets that loss consume him. A man who's not just unlocking internal demons, but literal ones. Someone who wants to blame his own kid for the death of his wife, knowing good and damn well that those goons only showed up because of his past, and he wasn't there. How that cycle of outrunning your past continues with his own son when he leaves for America. And it isn't until his aunt reminds him that he's a part of everything that came before him, good and bad, that he realizes he's also a stepping stone for the future. That as a collective, you don't outrun your past, but embrace it. So for a franchise that seems to only deal with death when they're trying to save money, I like that they stuck to it and got a director who embraced pain and loss and how the aftermath of how you cope with it can be a superpower in and of itself. And Dustin walks that talk. The trickiest day was the day that my second son was born, which was two months into production. I had to rush my wife to, um, to the hospital in the middle of the night. I stayed with my wife in, in the hospital, um, but, but the production continued and I had to direct via FaceTime. So I'd go out into the, into the hallway and they would show me the shot and I would say, oh, it looks good. And then, um, so that was definitely a challenging day. 
So obviously a lot of the upcoming Marvel superheroes are going to be flying directly to our screens at home because as the MCU expands, it seems like the theatrical to streaming continues to mesh. Like even Lord Feige put it that you're going to have to be watching the movies to get the shows and then the shows to get the movies. So why not bring the movies to you? So a big shout out to Nebula for sponsoring this video with their line of projectors from the ones that fit right into your pocket to this gorgeous starlit 4K Cosmos Max they sent our way for our Marvel catch up. It's got that cinema resolution with all the specs you need to get the best picture for your shows games, sports, sermons, listen. It even has these 360 speakers built right into it with Dolby Digital Audio so that you can have that theater surround sound without being surrounded by sneezes, coughs, and Feige knows what else. But what I really like is that you can boost this bad boy to go up to 150 inches and it can be fine-tuned to however you need it to be. So no matter what corner, angle, or nook and cranny you have it in, it can be adjusted so that you have the perfect display. You can even set it up at home. You can take it with you on the go, outdoors. Hell, I've seen some of these theaters even looking a little rough, so bring it to them and do them a favor it already comes with 5,000 apps that you can just log in and stream but it does have an hdmi usb wireless casting so it has everything else that you need to get set up so if you're ready to boost your cinema experience head over to the links down below to get some discounts support the channel and bring the movies to you with the best projection at home possible kind of like those avengers in the after credits oh. Come on. I do think it was dope to see Brie Larson appear in a scene, considering how many projects she's done with the director, so like, why not appear in the biggest one, since you got the Marvel news while you were filming with him? And in true Captain Marvel fashion, she dips even before Wong, but it's Banner who seems to still be hurt from that gauntlet snap that he did in Endgame, so I guess he wasn't. Made for this. They also talked about still trying to understand the rings and the origin of them, what powers it truly harnesses, and at this point, it really could be sending out a signal to literally anybody. It could be something in the upcoming The Marvels movie, or The Celestials and Eternals, Maybe he's calling out to Feige before Deadpool comes for him. Because you just know that would be the fourth wall break that he'd do. Deadpool wanting to talk to the manager of the MCU. But I'm most curious to see how they're going to flesh out the dragon scale armor. The only thing that was able to take out the dweller. Because at this point we'd have that and vibranium, soon adamantium. It's going to be a whole Marvel periodic table. On top of that, they talked about the design of Shang-Chi suit. And how it's meant to call back to traditional symbols that were embroidered on top. I thought that was a pretty cool suit, but... Not as clean as the one this man rocked on the red carpet. That one got two banderas. <laughs> In terms of other easter eggs and references and crazy credits, we saw an extremist fighter from Iron Man 3 fighting alongside a Black Widow from Florence Pugh's feature film. There were several posters in the rooms, but the one that really stood out to me was the Kung Fu Hustle poster because I absolutely love that movie, everyone should check it out. But Wai Yoon plays the landlord in that movie, and he also appears here as a dude who trained Aquafina, only for her to just stand there and see his soul get sucked. Interestingly enough, Michelle Yeoh also had a part in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 playing another character, so if Marvel's going to be recasting actors, I I would really like to see Andy Lay, who played Death Dealer, behind the mask in this one, for, for him to come back, because this guy started off doing martial arts on YouTube, and now he's in a Marvel movie doing flips at the red carpet. I've been recommending Paper Tigers, which is a dope little indie festival flick, which he's also in. It's now playing on Netflix, so do yourself a favor and go catch that one. You did an Avengers um, parody. Oh, yeah. So when you were doing that, did you ever think that you would be here? Well, actually, like, that was only a couple years ago, and a couple years ago, how much can change within like a year or two years and now we're standing here on a red carpet it's just it's mind-blowing that's that's a testament to anything can happen as long as you believe in your dreams and you fight for it then there's all the language references which i was really happy that they didn't just make the whole movie english like they actually made it in mandarin they, they could have gone farther but i'll always be there reading the subtitles if it's actually going to immerse you into the world it's aiming to and in terms of translations i still think that okja has one of the best ones especially when contrasting uh, english and how it serves as a nice little easter egg for those who are bilingual and shang chi actually had a little bit of that with the i speak abc's line that had the entire theater laughing only for me to realize later that there was a lot more to it. So the people who don't know what ABC is, they probably thought it was just like ABC as in English. English, yeah. So it was a nicely scripted line. Yeah. yeah. That like so, spoke on two levels. Yeah, yeah. Case. Basically yeah. Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm gonna have their video linked down below for them to explain that second meaning because it was actually deeper than I thought. Timeline wise, I believe Shang-Chi would have been born around 1998, which would be the year of the dragon. He would then have left for his first assignment when he was 14, met Kate and graduated with her in 2017, leading to this movie taking place after the blip and around, I'm assuming the same time as Spider-Man Far From Home, so it's probably 2027. And by then, there should be dozens of references to the blip. Like this past year alone had us all sitting at home and we're gonna be seeing signs for a while. So imagine if half the earth was gone. 
on. They do showcase some blip ads dealing with anxiety medication, even one that's supposed to be a blip app for dating others who've been blipped so that y'all can get blopped. And while I'd argue that there should be more, they were too busy with their car ads with the M and BMW by this point signing for Marvel. The road to success is long and winding. But I guess they went electric, so cool. There's also a bunch of pop culture references from Rich Brian being MCU canon with 88 Rising doing the soundtrack, which I thought was super solid. Like, I hope Marvel keeps up with all the soundtracks like they've been doing since Black Panther, which Kendrick ushered in, because they actually are able to be, you know, soundtracks that you actually want to listen to. We also get name drops to Jeff Gordon, who wasn't actually number one in wins, but three, so it could have also been an Aqua ad-lib, unless he was racing the five years when everyone was gone and he actually did go up to number one. And I feel like it is going to become a big deal to see who in the MCU was blipped or not in terms of celebrity status. Lil Nas X obviously made it and that's become a big deal and not, you know not to call him the bad guy but I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure he's hoping Billy got dusted so he could have kept that number one but I do feel they're going to continue building the internal pop culture world and you know Disney's like Apple they're just gonna take a bit that's already been done and just do it bigger so I can definitely see a Bill Murray Zombieland type sequence where we see how a celebrity was affected post blip and I just I feel like it's gonna be Drake since he's already been mentioned in the MCU he's been trying to get back into acting I'd say still is and with 50% of people gone I can already hear this man on the soundtrack going I knew you weren't my better half you're not in my script I'd get another in a snap I still felt whole when you blipped what are you doing what wait that said it did look like that hairline got snapped. Yeah. In terms of team-ups, I feel like they should have a whole show just on that. I think it'd be better than whatever that What If series is, but I know he's had adventures with Iron Fist, and as long as they recast him and just do that completely over, I can see him being in a movie with him, but uh, again, I do want Shang-Chi to be by himself. Uh, I know that there are other characters, like the Hulk, who due to Universal's rights, isn't allowed to have his own movie, and that's why he had to share it with Thor, so I am really curious to see how his cousin series, She-Hulk, is going to turn out, and I know that they've even been hinting at Tim Roth returning for that one and he actually did some grunts for Abomination in this one so like I said slowly but surely they're taking all those ones from Universal and honestly with all the updated CGI for airbending and Kamehameha's both of which they reference within the movie it's only a matter of time before they also get a good live action Dragon Ball and Avatar but until then director Destin talked about there being a lot more backstory for the Ten Rings so while I know everything's always intertwining I am hoping that Shang-Chi itself is able to build up its own franchise and storyline because they've come a long way. I always dread revisiting. Oh my god. I think it's I think it's the Spider-Man for kids birthday parties. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my Joe jobs. That was one of the jobs that I took to kind of make a living in the meantime while I was while I was auditioning and like those are some really rough times. And now he's going to be slinging alongside him in theaters as kids dress up as him. Thank you all for watching this video. And again, a big shout out to Nebula for bringing projectors that get you the big screen at home. Uh, I'm curious to know y'all's thoughts, theories, concerns, all of that. Uh, I personally did think it was a really fun movie. And that's kind of like the point of these Marvel movies. I'm not expecting them to be you know, Sundance Fair, Con Fair. Like we're on movie 25. So at this point, you either know if it's for you or not. And it's not perfect. There's still too much CGI in the third act, in my opinion. A lot of corny quips in the middle of fights just to solve things. But... Uh, I think it balanced it out well. There was more highs than there was lows in my opinion, but other than that, I'm curious to know what you're looking forward to in terms of movies, the TV shows. They've blended so much. Again, gotta watch one to get the other, uh, and it's just expanded to the point that, you know, now the theaters are back open and the movie made some money, back to those dozen Marvel projects a year. So uh, until next time, let me know your thoughts on this one or any other things. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe, and I'll send you your own pet, Morris. <laughs> Okay, well, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. he steals the show. <laughs>